Welcome to the Scandinavian Mind podcast, our weekly show about how technology is changing the creative industries. Today on the program, how to innovate physical retail. I am joined by our special guest, Jonathan Harlambakis, VC manager, gone entrepreneur. Jonathan is the founder of X Nomad, a Stockholm-based startup that aims to transform two innately traditional industries, real estate and physical retail. XNOMAD is a marketplace platform that connects brands to empty spaces to make unique pop-up shops. In this conversation we talk about what it's like to digitize conservative industries like real estate and retail, how the pandemic helped accelerate the digitization, what he does to bring data-driven decision making to the physical space, and how his background as a banker has helped him in the startup and lifestyle industries. My name is Konrad Olsson editor-in-chief and founder of Scandinavian Mind. Don't forget to sign up to our newsletter not to miss out on any content and events. Visit scandinavianmind.com slash newsletter. And just a note to say where we are in the midst of finalizing our next print issue, the fourth print issue of Scandinavian Mind. So be on the lookout for that end of April. Now I bring you Jonathan Haralambakis, founder of X Nomad, recorded in our podcast studio at Helio Co-working Space in Stockholm. Enjoy. All right, I am here with Jonathan Haralambakis, founder of X Nomad. Jonathan, welcome to the studio. Thank you very much for having me. It looks really amazing. Nice to be here. Thank you. Uh, I've been, uh, you know, looking forward to having this conversation. I think our worlds intersect in more ways than one. I think the industries that we work in are uh, pretty much the same industries. It's fashion, design, beauty, mobility. Um, I have throughout my career and building my own brand been touching on uh, retail, physical retail, traditional retail, also working with uh, some of the real estate companies here in Stockholm, which I know you are. Um, so I just have a ton of questions. But we're going to talk about this very kind of traditional setting, which you are entering, wanting to innovate. So um, can we just start by giving kind of a state of play? Where are we right now in terms of, of physical retail? Yeah, um, thanks very much for the intro. And so what I think is really interesting on like where is retail heading and what is the future is basically what you're asking. So what we see at X Nomad is a lot of changes happening, right? So what's been happening on, let's say, the demand side for consumers mm. is that we're becoming more like convenience orientated, more experience minded. And we're really looking for like a bespoke tailored solutions for us, but at a price which is not insane. Right. Mm. So that's one shift that's happening in consumer demand. For retail, things are changing quite dramatically due to the fact that store formats are changing. Customers' tastes and needs are different. And now what we're looking for is individuals, which retailers are really trying to figure out, is something that can be tailored towards our needs and preferences, but we can get it instantaneously, which is very difficult, right? And finally, when you walk out on streets, what you're looking for is like some sort of immersive experience because you can get all those things like online, you get all these dopamine hits, right? You get all these different interactions with all this data and all these cool things happening to you. So when you go out in the real world, you're looking for something to make you be in awe. And that's what's really happened with retail. The store of the past, which is generic and mass produced, is now changing into more experiential things. Very exciting. I, I want to get into it. Let's give people kind of the headlines on what X Nomad does so we know your service and your kind of product setup, and, and we'll get into uh, this stuff more on, on, on how the, the landscape is changing. Yeah, so X Nomad is a marketplace for short term retail space. Mm. So we connect brands to empty spaces to make these amazing pop up shops. What we're actually trying to do as a company is we've seen that whole shift post pandemic of how everyone thought that the world would be solely online only, right? And actually what we're trying to do as an organization is we're trying to bring that city back to the people for when, when you do go out, right. you have the best type of experience. So that's essentially what we do. We're a marketplace platform that connects brands to empty spaces to make unique pop-up shops. Mm. We also help 
a brands build, design, market, and fabricate pop-up shops through our platform. And we also help landlords utilize spaces, find the right tenant mix, and provide them a software tool to manage all these short-term leases, which they've never had to. Because the whole idea is retail is changing, real estate is changing, and things are becoming shorter and more flexible. And that's exactly what we help try and provide. I have an experience I'm going to share, and I'm going to be curious to hear your experience when entering into this space, uh, specifically entering into this, the, the, the Swedish space. I know you work uh, globally and uh, at least across Europe with, with uh, your products. Um, when I started to work more behind the scenes in the world of uh, you know, consumer goods and fashion, you know, kind of coming from uh, the angle of a journalist or an editor, starting to work more intricately with, with brands, starting doing events together with real estate uh, agencies. What I saw was a shockingly analog world. And, you know, there had been so much talk about innovating these industries, digitizing them. But, you know, what I realized was so much of the digitization, so much the innovation had, had been on the kind of e-commerce side, on the purely digital side. Whereas, I don't know exactly the numbers, but somewhere around at least 60% of uh, you know, fashion purchases are still done in the physical space. And that world has not changed at all, at least when I got into it five or six years ago. And here's what, what I'm curious of, of your take on it. Uh, when you decided to take on this challenge, what 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 were some of the hurdles? How did you see this world? Wasn't it a lot of pushback uh, from from kind of the traditional players? Yes, I completely agree. So exactly what you're saying is essentially true. So both retail is quite analog, even though it's going through this mass digitization, and real estate is unbelievably analog. But they also going through the same shift. But in essence, they didn't really have to previously. So that's why we believe that that store consistently remained the same, partly due to two factors. One, for retailers, when they opened new stores of the same generic format, which was cost effective, easy to scale, easy to ship and easy to implement, it still resulted in more sales, right? Mm. The more stores you do, the more sales you get, and you are just creating this cash cow. And then on the real estate side is you weren't really incentivized to digitize because you were signing 25, 30 year leases in some markets. I mean, yeah. like, why would you worry about building a piece of technology <laughs> when you sign a piece of paper and you forget it? And then maybe your children <laughs> will be the ones dealing with that problem. So those are, th those are two industries which are both very analog. So when I joined, obviously the retail and real estate industry, I thought that digitizing this process would be easy. Unfortunately, it has been possibly the single hardest thing I've ever had to do. <laughs> On top of the fact that I had to do it during a pandemic, yeah, which was definitely not fun. Um, but long story short, yes, two very analog industries changing now quite rapidly mm. in a very difficult market because they haven't needed that shift. Mm. But now that shift has happened and we're looking at an acceleration of change, but still with a lot of difficulty. It's like we're swimming upstream. Right. How you, know, you started uh, 2019, how much did the pandemic kind of help you get your kind of ideas across? Was, was that, you know, you know, aside the fact that there was a big tragedy you know, on a human level, but did it, did it, did it kind of help you uh, get the market to understand why we needed change? Very much so. Um, so look, the pandemic offset and accelerated a lot of s fundamental things mm. that needed to change, right? These are all systemic and they're all going to happen. It just basically made it happen within a year or two rather than five right. or let's say 10. So yes, for us, the pandemic helped accelerate change in two folds. One, e-commerce, which was growing at a very steady pace, actually quite exponentially, literally grew exponentially during the pandemic, right? Mm. And then what was the result of that? all these big e-commerce players were now fighting for customer acquisition cost because people were spending all their money digitally, mm -hmm. right? Therefore, you run ads digitally. Therefore, if everyone does that, that drives up your cost of acquiring a user. And then for e-commerce stores in particular, there's a lot of returns. There's a number of different overheads, not on the retail front, but still a lot of different things that are happening. So if your cost is rising and your returns are rising, you're therefore going to start losing money. 
So essentially what they were looking for at the end of the day was how can we find ways to A, show our digital customers that we can also be a physical brand and you can touch, feel, taste, and see what we're producing. You don't really know an e-commerce brand until you see it in a physical space and you know what they're about, right? Mm. So that was one thing that happened. And then the second thing that happened is in real estate in particular, what are real estate buildings? What does commercial real estate mean? It's basically a portion is retail and a portion is office. And what happened during yep. the pandemic? No one went back to the office and then no one really wanted to shop physically, right? So then what do they need to do in order to try and salvage this change? So what they thought was, all right, well, if we start digitizing more rapidly, maybe this can help us. And that offset that shift to go, all right, wow, people do want flexibility. Oh my God, we literally don't have any software to help us manage these flexible things. And that's what allowed them to digitize very rapidly. And they're doing so now to cater towards these two needs. Wonderful. You came into kind of the lifestyle space from a different angle. You uh, you were in banking in London. Um, you have a kind of a, a, a Greek-British background, if I remember correctly. Can we just give us a, a sense of where you came from when entering uh, uh, the, the startup space with XNOMAD? Yeah, thanks. Uh, very, very different mindset, actually. Uh, so yes, my background was banking, consulting, and VC, right? Mm -hmm. And then I grew up in South Africa, and I grew up in Greece, and then I studied in London, and I lived in America. So then I got a lot of different experiences from around the world and how different places act. So coming from like a technical, results-driven, and very granular type of background, I thought that digitizing retail would be very easy, right? It seemed very basic. It seemed like a couple of slides that you do in consulting, right? <laughs> Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Exactly. It doesn't work like that. Absolutely not the case. So what I would like to say is probably ignorance is bliss on the first front. Yeah. The second front is, cool, I did have some experience in building marketplaces before as I made a tutoring platform at the University of Oxford, which I raised capital for previously. Hmm. So with those experience, I thought that doing that same type of change, but in a different type of industry would be very basic and straightforward. Because if you think about it, it's, you know, landlord wants brand, brand wants space, create a platform which yeah. connects these two through technology, super straightforward. Unfortunately, it's actually a little bit more to that. The processes are different, there's different customer types, but uh, through time, you obviously learn these things. And I was already too in, too quick, too deep uh, to actually take a step back. So we were lucky that the pandemic, the Swedish culture, all the different investors, the environment here, as well as the people helped mm. accelerate this and helped accelerate our business because the Nordics is a unique place where everyone likes to give opportunity and try new things. So I think that's one of the contributing factors which helped. Mm. I, I almost feel like it's necessary that someone with your background and we've met a couple of times now, so I also will say someone with your energy can come in and try to make this shift happen. Uh, because I, I've been in some of these meetings uh, with real estate companies, you know, I've worked with, you know, traditional uh, retail companies. The, the incentive, as you said, to change, it's not there. You, you, you're not entering the conversation almost on the same level. Uh, and you kind of get this resistance in, you know, at the at the outset almost. What what was? Can you can you speak? To, you don't have to give in a specific example or or give name names, but can you talk at all about some of those situations where you had to kind of pull strengths from inside to 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 try to you you know try to really push your agenda, try to really say, I know this needs to happen. You know, come follow me. I completely agree. So this journey has been literally swimming upstream, mm. um, partly because, yeah, these two industries aren't really incentivized to change, but lots of systemic effects have now made them do so. Mm. So I can give you a couple of examples of how it's quite interesting. So given the fact that I grew up in so many different places, I've seen how, you know, real estate as well as retail works different in different cultures, different societies. You know, America is very consumer focused. Yeah. Sweden is very trend focused. Um, South Africa is also very necessities focused. It really depends on that type of mix of people. So when I moved here, obviously with this international background, I remember coming to one of the most prestigious landlords here in Stockholm, for instance. I won't name name, but everyone probably knows. And I remember meeting them for the first time and explaining this concept of pop-up retail. 
who they were somewhat aware of. They're like, oh, this is this cool thing that's happening abroad. You know, but in the Nordics here, it's this thing called a sample sale. So then like his face turned white. I remember when he looked at it and I was like, I want to do pop-ups in your super prime, beautiful, aesthetically pleasing <laughs> places. And the picture that was in his head was a sample sale. And then I looked at him and I was like, describe what you're thinking a bit more because I can see from your face that you don't seem very excited. And mm. then he described what his idea of a pop-up shop was. And then I looked at him and I was like, no, uh, no, absolutely not. This is essentially not what I'm talking about. I am talking about a store that you walk into that is A, digitally native, or B, from an existing retailer or a new brand. But when you walk in, the first thing you feel is you feel amazed. You're there for the experience. You're not there to like buy all these different things. You're there to really understand who the people are behind the brand, what motive they're going to. And at the end of the day, you're trying to find that feeling which makes you have a good time, right? And then after describing to him that and showing, him things, showing them examples of what stores look like internationally, that's when the idea or the light bulb went on for them saying, you know what, this is actually pretty cool. Mm. We need some sort of solution like this. Let me call you in six months and then we can figure <laughs> that out. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, I still think the real estate owners or the landlords are too slow uh, when I interact with them. But, but there has been change and there, there are people uh, in the industry that are actually thinking quite more, innovate, I, 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 more innovative and are more open to change. But uh, overall, the, there needs to be, I think, a bit, bit more fast moving. And that's why I'm so impressed with what you've done because you really fostered these relationships. And when you go on your website, you see all these locations that you have connected to the X Nomad uh, platform. And I know that's no easy feat uh, because I've been trying to recruit pop-up stores for some of my clients. And I, you, it just, this is a lot of time and no. grit and grind <laughs> associated with it. Am I right or you're laughing? That is essentially <laughs> it. So this is what we do. So we make the process very easy for the user on the outside. Yeah. So we've been fortunate to use a number of different technologies and tools to help enable finding retail spaces. Mm. Step two, we've also done a lot of different changes within our organization on how we can cater towards brands for helping them try physical retail for the first time for e-commerce because it's a very scary business. Mm. You know, building a retail store is actually somewhat difficult if you have no idea how it works, right? And then step two, as a landlord, obviously you want a super long-term lease. You would like a really designed and aesthetically pleasing store, right? But it's really hard to find the right mix. So essentially what we've done at X Nomad is we've helped A, provide brands a very easy way to find spaces that they think fit for themselves, right? Two, we've coupled that with data, since e-commerce stores are super like data-driven. So they go, great, we can look at things like footfall, age, gender, spend, dwell time, so we can actually target our demographic. And then part three, we've also helped them easily build and fabricate stores through all the experiences of what we've seen in our stores, right? To give them like a, not a white label solution, but a very standardized package to go, hey, e-commerce brand, do you want to try retail for the first time? Here is a super cool looking store with some very easy essential elements which can be shipped to you. And here is a playbook mm. on how to scale it for your customer. And that's basically what we're doing because we're just wanting to A, limit risks for brands and B, provide landlords the opportunity to build the right tenant mix. Right. Talk about the data part of what you just said because I think that's um, uh, also one fascinating uh, part, uh, you know, going to the point of how something can be so analog still. Um, you know, when you look under the hood of some of the biggest kind of retail outfits, where department stores, etc., you know, I think the fax machine is still alive and active some someplace. Uh, and uh, you know, also you know, working with uh, uh, you know manufacturers in Italy and all these places, it's it's not that technically savvy uh, sometimes. Uh, talk about how you provide data because this is really something I think brands need. Uh, it's something we need long term to fix uh, sustainability and issues of kind of overproduction and, and these kind of issues. If we don't have data, we can't optimize, we can't change, we can't scale back what we don't need and scale up what we do need and so forth. So, and I know you, uh, I don't know if you define yourself as a tech company, but uh, you know, you have tech at, at the kind of the core of what you're doing. You have kind of a classic tech investors uh, backing your company. Um, give me some insights on, on what you're trying to create and how you're servicing the, the brands with that. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So what we're trying to do 
is we are essentially trying to get those things that you find as an e-commerce store, for instance, as a digital player and put them in physical retail, right? Mm -hmm. We're trying to get brands to understand, A, this customer data you see digitally, you mm -hmm. can actually also get physically. So how does that all work? So we use telecoms, towers, and in-store sensors to help brands identify where to pop up based on their customer demographic. All right. So you can be like a German scarf brand looking to target the high income segment in the Swedish market. To a Swede, you know that's basically us the mom, right? But to a German scarf brand, you have no idea, right? So what is their process today? It's call a couple brokers, maybe read some materials online, try and find the right mix. And what we realized was, you know, obviously we can just make this all through our platform. So you as a brand can mm. come in, select, I am targeting females 25 to 35 in the high income segment. And then you go, you see various locations and then you go, oh, I'm actually looking for maybe a gender split of X or a dwell time of Y. Something that is a little bit more leading into a more focused area. And then once we provide that data, it makes it super easy to make an informed decision because retail is somewhat analog. And being an e-commerce store, you're basically so used to making data-driven decisions. So if we can marry these two things, that's how we can help it. And then on the supply side for the landlords, what's really interesting is we help them understand which brand works best in this space. Mm. So we go, hey, big landlord, you've had 15 pop-ups in your spaces of varying tenants, right? You can see through the data now that we're providing you that hmm, the shoe brand competed better than the t-shirt brand. Therefore, the neighbors of the shoe brand are also more happy. So this provides you the right tenant mix to increase your prices to have the goal of building an amazing city. So those are some things. And then um, finally, in terms of data, like there's so many different trends and shifts into what's happening in retail and real estate, right? So everything is connected through obviously a number of different sensors and IoT devices. So you can have, I don't know, air conditioning units, footfall measurements, heat traffic. You can have um, a number of different systems on sustainability. It's wild what's out there. And there needs to be some sort of infrastructure provider. So then we're trying to be that surface layer on top of all things brands and real estate. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of like fashion brands, which is very interesting, you have the whole augmented reality AR, right? So you can... Let's, let's wait on. I want to get to that. But talk, I still go back to what you just said, because I find it very fascinating. The gathering of data, which can be, you just mentioned, you know, cell phone activity and, and those sort of things. Is it easy to find that data? And, you know, the, I guess the second part of that would be to translate that into something that's valuable for the brand to actually get some kind of actionable decision based out of. So not just like delivering the raw data, but, but also interpreting it and saying like, based on what we know here, here is our suggestion to you. Yeah, so there's a number of different ways you can do that. So we use a lot, a lot of big third parties that basically fabricate, amalgamate, and you know, condense some of this data. And then we use business intelligence tools to actually display it really easily. So there's a lot of data out there. Mm -hmm. It's finding which is the most accurate data for your cause or for the thing you're trying to solve. And then B, how can you present this to someone that is not used to receiving insights like this in a very easily digestible way? So for us, it was really straightforward. It's like, okay, so how do brands find spaces? They look at these five metrics. Yeah. Okay, where do I find these five metrics? Oh, these are these four data providers that provide this kind of stuff. So then we go to those data providers and say, hey, I know that you don't know how to monetize this data. We know that there is a way to do so. So if we were to work together, we can help provide it to these two customer demographics right, like the big retailers or the small retailers or the e-commerce stores and the big landlords. And then those, tele those telcos and number of data providers are like, great, we can now have an another vertical that we can actually use to help scale out our product. So it's very intersectionally married together. You're uh, practically doing business development for these guys. Yeah, somewhat. I am their technical sales guy. <laughs> um, it was interesting because the reason why I knew how this worked is that in my last startup, we had a partnership with Vodafone. Mm -hmm. And basically, they showed how they have all these different kinds of data metrics. Mm. So then when I moved to Stockholm, the first thing I did is I went to one of the largest telcos over here and said, hey, I know you have this data. Can you please give it to me? And then we can work together on trying to make this accessible to everyone. Yeah. 
So let's talk about who you are serving on the brand side, because uh, you know we mentioned fashion. Uh, I know you have you know some uh, mobility clients, beauty clients, so forth. Um, what does the kind of mix look like in terms of, uh, of, of brands you you serve, and you know what is the decision in in terms of what you target, what what you're going after? Cool. So who we go after and what is actually available are some different things, right? What essentially is very cool about pop-up shops is actually a pop-up shop could be anything. It could be a non-traditional yeah. retail player coming into a retail space. So examples include, we did pop-up shops for Voy. <laughs> Voy is a mobility company, yeah. right? You would never imagine a scooter company making a cool pop-up shop to meet their customers and showcase their brand, right? Mm. Part of these Voice stores was all around their safety campaigns about how Voice is a really safe scooter, how they're super connected to family orientation, and basically they were giving away a number of different free helmets and doing safety guides on how to drive it properly. So you don't have any risks associated with that. There's so many examples. So who do we target? So we target fashion, food, fitness, and tech companies, right? Mm -hmm. But what's also interesting, we get approached by a number of different non-traditional players in the markets. It could be recruitment companies. It could be, you know, companies like IBM doing something for a different segment of what they own. So essentially, pop-up shops can be anything your imagination sees fit. You just need to spin it in the right way to get to the right customer who you're targeting. So on our part, big customers are obviously all the fashion brands, fashion weeks, and all these things. Tech companies amazing looking to find new users really looking to test new products really looking to expand in new markets so also pop-up shops help expand into new markets in a very risk-free way right you open up shop you test it out you get the data you see the results and then you roll it on mm. or you roll it off right um, another interesting thing that we've seen too is so on the food front is very interesting as well uh, food scenes are developing over time as countries are becoming you know, more international, as globalization is hitting. So pop-up food and pop-up restaurants are actually very exciting, partly because what we will see are like single dish restaurants, like what you got in London, where you go to one place and you only eat that steak and chips, or you only eat that chicken burger, or you only have that like amazing Vietnamese bao. So that's a good opportunity too that we see. And then finally, the what's really interesting is we get giant international e-commerce stores that are trying new markets, right, in a completely different approach to how European brands do it. They basically only market through TikTok. They make these really quick pop-up shops that have a very defined target group and offering. And then they actually use a huge amount of social, influ uh, social media influencers to scale out all that brand. And they do this so quickly that it just becomes this cyclical loop in multiple markets that they come on. So we've basically called these things pop-up tours. Go into multiple markets, five, six at a different time, over a staggered period, and for your final stop, you have the potential to do that in the metaverse too, which is quite wild. Uh, and we've done this with uh, Klarna and a few other big companies. That's a great segue to talk about experience. I guess my first question would be, what is the general attitude towards doing something physical? because you're talking about a lot of D to C brands. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about a sector, as I mentioned, that has you know, associated innovation with the digital experience or the e-commerce experience. Um, but there are tendencies you can see in entertainment as well. Right? There was a, some news story just uh, out today about Apple going into movie theaters with, with some of their offering, which is like, you know, Apple is, I think, the ultimate example of a brand that they started retail just to, you know, increase the kind of luxury aspect of, of their brand. Phys the, phys the physical store became a marketing event in a way. Um, just, just, you know, on a general sense, you know, how do people view physical activities today? And then we'll go into talking about how to design them. That is actually a really interesting question. So how people are viewing physical activities today is probably more on a brand front, right? This is the first time you're able to see a brand in a real realm, right? And you can get a very good understanding of the vibe of that brand when you walk into that store for the very first time. Like, they might have this appearance online, but when you go there physically and you see the little intricacies of the details in their business, you know, it could be, it could be a triangle lying on in a particular way. It could be a fabric, like, so what we see is pop-ups are a good A, marketing spend, 
right, to acquire customers cheaper and be a very interesting way to have people find a brand physically and see a really easy way to test out these products in new markets because tastes are very different, right? So that's one aspect that we look at. Two, how people view stores um, is, look, e-commerce stores love it because it allows them to basically scale into new markets very quickly and get it very cheaply instead of spending ads. Mm. Existing retailers like it because they get to try new store formats with not as much risk. So we have like a large Spanish uh, retailer that is looking to change their store formats. And what they are very keen on is something called an activation space. So when we mean physical retail, which is experiential, we mean having a cool store, but with something entertaining inside. So what does that mean? It could be a beauty bar, it could be a coffee shop, it could be some cool wall with a great visual identity that you can build, build stuff in. It's like everything in a store that is actually not being sold to you. Right. I, one of the problems I see with kind of the lifestyle sector, particularly fashion, <clears throat> is the lack of storytelling and the lack of experience you put into your kind of brand story or brand experience. There's data out recently on um, social media performance. And what you see is fashion is actually the least engaging sector across the board, which stunned me. Uh, but in a way, it didn't surprise me because, and, and this is a topic that I go back to, I think fashion brands need to say more. They need to attach a message to their brand. They need to, um, you know, activate themselves in a, in a much greater extent than to just serve up a product, which is what 99% of the brands do 98% of the time. And while we're seeing, and I'm curious to hear your take on this, uh, consumers are kind of craving purpose-driven brands. They want something that connects with their values. Uh, they want stories on sustainability or social issues or whatever it may be. But, uh, I, you know, I just, I just can't see the brands on a macro level actually catering to this. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, right? So if you were to look at how retail was, let's say, in 90s, 2000s, uh, 2010s, for instance, in the early 2010s, it was basically a sales per square meter thing, mm. right? So when you open a store, you try to do X amount of sales per square meter of space. Yeah. So you just flooded it with items and you saw that the more items that you had or a particular section um, sold X amount, right? So that's one thing of how it changed. Then what happened on the customer side? We went, all right, well, I can essentially get all these things online. Right, so when I walk into a store, I don't want to see the things that I can see online. I want to see something else. Yeah. So actually a few retailers are getting really good at this. So like I have to actually tell H&M is doing pretty well on this part with some of their concept stores mm -hmm. where they have had like a beauty bar, a nail salon inside that place, in addition to ways that you can exchange certain goods and pick up your online. Like if you make a retail store a place to not only be inspired by it, but also to actually enjoy your time spent in it, mm. you're more likely to purchase something either digitally or physically. Right. So the store of the future is not one with just racks and clothes. The store of the future is more of an entertainment space, right? Where you can go with a friend, you can have a coffee, you can speak about everything else other than purchasing a product because you want to experience the product. And that's what I think is really cool what's happening now. I think we've seen some of the worst examples happen in the last few years as well. I mean, do we need a small co-working area in every fashion store? <laughs> when you're thinking about creating this experience, creating this value, creating this connection with people who walk into these uh, pop-up spaces that you design, what are some of the things you, you are looking to create? Yeah, actually, so one of the things that we're trying to infuse towards different brands is like, you know, the possibilities are endless. Mm. It's basically as far as your imagination goes, but it's also dependent basically on your budget as well. So one it's of the- It's always that. Unfortunately, it's always that. So one of the things that we're trying to do is like, how can we provide a store format or a customer journey that is accessible to brands of varying scales? Within that, how can we provide certain activations from what we've seen which can inspire users who come into that store, right? So what we have been seeing, which is very interesting, is a combination of 
activations in store plus events during that period that store is popping up is a very good way to market a store. So that could involve, we've had like an artist do design sketches for a particular clothing brand on a, the first few people who come into the store as a part. So then they get this little memento of when they come back. Step two, a really interesting thing is getting a influencer of a particular type who follows your brand in that way, a purposeful, let's say, um, influencer, who then comes to the store and visits it every few days and then meets a customer face to face, right? Another example is we've had like tattoo artists in certain pop-up shops, which is super really cool for really edgy brands. And then these people who enter the store well, obviously got a lifetime memento on their body, but <laughs> at the end of the day, it was something like that they remembered. And that's what we think is happening. And that's what we're trying to help brands do is anything you feel is possible can be possible because now retail allows you to have these experiential, these non-traditional and these new formats. So take a risk, try it out. At the end of the day, it's an experiment. You just mentioned budget and I'm curious about the kind of KPIs of this. How do you measure the success of an activity like this? And do the brands take this from their marketing budget, from their retail budget? What, what, where, how do they construct a project like this? Yeah, so there's a number of different ways. So we have different types of customer types. So let's say we have small, medium and large brands. Yeah. A small brand is an independent, a person, a man, a woman with, you know, an idea and they really want to make their idea real because everyone can make a website, but having a physical retail space is mm. the first time your brand becomes a thing. Right, that's what's super cool. Then we have the medium brand, like the flatter, naked, nearly. Companies who've really got a good exposure online, they've grown quite a lot, and they're looking at, okay, how can we actually bring a physical presence and actually showcase to everyone like how cool our brand essentially is in real life. And then we have the large, big retailers, you know, like the Sheens or the H and M's or the Massimo Duties, things like that, right? Or we can have some super high-end brands, let's say Louis Vuitton and Oscar de la Renta, who also work with these guys. Um, for small brands, it would be how many people follow our social media channel, how many new customers we get um, physically, and then how does that translate to an increase in traffic online? That's for small. For medium brands, it's how can we, A, lower that cost, right, than our existing cost, right? And then step two, how can we actually have a longer-tailed effect on when these posts happen, do people want a new store in a new market? And then for large brands, what's really interesting is they actually do very different things. They build certain apps for these store purposes. So let's say the one that I did with Sheen and Klarna was in Barcelona, for instance, they basically, the purpose of the store, it was a showroom for people to see their different products, but the purpose was to download an app to then get all the data from the customer on what they buy mm. and what they looked at in the store. So they all have different things. And how this all works out is we help provide them a tool to actually see all these different things. And then at the end of the day, they try and measure what was that impact to our online spend? Mm -hmm. How can we make this omni-channel? So you arrived here in Stockholm, uh, so was it four or five years ago, um, from London and this international uh, career and background. Um, how would you describe the, the, the kind of business environment here in Stockholm and how can you speak at all about the, the differences between uh, working in, 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 in some of the international cities? Yeah, I think Stockholm has been actually a very refreshing environment, um, partly because it's actually a very small city with such a big reach. Mm. So what was very interesting when I first moved to Stockholm is you see these big powerhouse brands all around, right? And the irony is these things look like they're big and they are untouchable and it takes this so many layers and it's hard to find the right people. But ironically, in Sweden, these massive, massive companies are just a normal everyday average person that probably lives in your neighborhood, yeah. which is super interesting. So what was great for me is there's a few things in Swedish uh, business orientation, which I find amazing. One, it's a very pay it forward culture. So in Sweden, everyone basically introduce you to people without much ask, you know, in big cities is very much like give and take. Mm. I find in the Swedish, it's very much pay it forward. So it's been a phenomenal experience for myself where people are like, hey man, you have a great idea. This is cool. Yeah, sure. He has an introduction. And then that just goes miles. I think the second thing is you can meet anyone you want through another person. It's wild. I've never seen something like that. You can meet 
the highest levels of any kind of industry mm. through a person. Because why? Stockholm is small. So it's either the person went to high school with them or the kids go to daycare together or they have they bump into each other at restaurants. It's mm. phenomenal. So I've met some really amazing people because the top levels of Swedish society are also the top levels globally and you can only do it through one layer. As opposed to in London, there's like 40. You know, there's like 40 layers of pretentious stuff going around. I mean, stock, like Swedes are awesome for that stuff. I love it. Um, and then maybe the third thing about Sweden is Swedes really like new ideas and they're not scared to take a risk within reason. You know, so it's, it's a really cool environment where people like big corporates, especially are like, you know, why not? Why don't we try it? It's, these guys are only doing value add. It might help our business in the long run. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. But let's give these guys a shot. And I think that is uniquely Swedish. And I think that that is one of the best things on how this is probably going to be the biggest, let's say, startup hub globally in the next few years. Great to hear. And I know you came from kind of the VC background. So I'm sure you uh, were using some of those connections to when you were fundraising for your own company. But uh, can you share a little bit of that experience with trying to find the, the means to, to realize your vision? So how did we find the means to realize our vision? So yes, um, obviously with much difficulty. It's never really easy fundraising for a retail business, especially during a pandemic. Um, that wasn't very fun, but we managed to pull it off and get some oh, pretty yeah, good. Oh yeah, you had a round in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah, we did. Um, how can I describe this? <laughs> Imagine literally walking to a bunch of people and expressing we to them do like physical retail, guys. <laughs> yes, and then everyone's sitting there like, oh, oh retail has changed, it's going to be dead. And I'm like, I don't think you guys realize that. Like obviously I grew up in you know, I grew up in South Africa, right? It's a very different environment. Yeah. Like the context that I've had is regardless of how crazy society is, people are still very normal. You know, people still go to work every day. People still, you know, bake bread at certain things. Like people get back to normality very quickly. So when we were fundraising during this period, I remember just speaking to investors and saying like, look, this, the human race will achieve remarkable things when they have to. Mm. This has been proven hundreds of times before, especially even when it came to vaccines. You know, you can look at polio and things like that, for instance. So when we were communicating these things to them, I was saying, look, this is a very short term thing. Mm. Like obviously I'm from Africa, people get back to normal very quickly. So one, once this is normal, we will be at the forefront of that change because real estate is changing. The fundamentals were there. Retail is changing. You can see in different markets how this pop-up thing is growing. So during this conversation and this environment, it was very much getting people to believe in the future and having the naivety of believing in the future. And I think the Swedish ecosystem has been very good at that because they've helped startups like ourselves uh, basically get over that initial hump. So... One, yes, we fundraised uh, from a number of different VCs using my existing network, but also the network of like Antler, Sting, Elmi Invest, Luminar Ventures, PropTech Farm, all of these amazing VCs. Right. right. These guys are, they introduced me to a number of amazing companies. Two, being Swedish Incorporated also helps because the rest of the world looks at Sweden as the innovator and forerunner of all things amazing. And it's absolutely true because they take the risk to allow people to try that. Most other markets will never let you do that. This place is amazing for that. It's, it's astonishingly cool. Let's uh, round up the conversation with talking a little bit about the future. Um, is there anything in, in the long term that you see that you haven't mentioned? Anything you, you foresee that will become more important or will change the, the way a real estate company needs to, to operate or retailers need to operate? Oh, that's actually a very interesting question. So super, super, super long term in the future. I think that a lot of things will be very flexible, mm. right? So stores will be only opening for two, three, six months at a time, generally, because the, cons the customer demand and customer tastes change so quickly. I do see, like I know people are a little bit cautious around this whole metaverse ideal, but essentially something along these lines will happen. People will live in more online realms. Mm. And the reason why I th believe it will be here is because if you look at online gaming since the 90s, you know, you have Diablo, you have World of Warcraft, that was the original metaverse, guys. Like, that's essentially it. Now it's just coming to the masses who aren't gamers, yeah. right? So I definitely see things like that happening. Um, the final thing is, like, augmented reality and all these things. Definitely see this is going to be some part of it. I mean, you can use these things right now, the existing states of technology. 
uh, to make things a little bit more interesting. But I am very convinced there will be a way that we will marry these things together and it will be actually amazing to use. And then finally, I mean, obviously you see all the hype with um, ChatGPT, all the large language learning models, which will be great. So I think this will essentially change everything as in like it's an iPhone-ish moment mm. where you're getting things from multiple industries and integrating them into a singular thing. This thing or this tool will help enable people to easily make ideas, mm. concepts, content through just literally inputting a certain amount of variables. So all the hard administrative work is done. So how you apply this to retail, you have store optimizations, you have customer layouts, you have customer service, which is great. So you don't need to hire a million people for different headcount things. You can see how different flows of traffic happen in stores. You can basically see how the communication of a brand digitally can then affect a brand physically. It's just you know, the opportunities are going to be endless and I'm very excited to see what the future holds. And are there any of these examples you just mentioned that you want to cater to more with XNOMAD? Yeah, so we are definitely using all the ChatGPT's APIs, all of the things, 110%. <laughs> you walked into this interview uh, with uh, pre pre prepped questions from ChatGPT saying, I'm going to read this. And uh, thankfully you didn't. Oh, I know, but it probably would have been more interesting as well. <laughs> But yes, we did do that. And yeah, it's been very fun. Mm. And in terms of the digital part, let's end on that because that to me is, to me, one of the biggest trends happening right now too, which I think essentially will marry the first kind of wave of Metaverse, Web3, all these ideas that came like, you know, a year, two years ago, a huge trend. They were, We kind of peaked on the, uh, the law of diffusion of innovation, that first kind of uh, uh, trend curve. I think we're at the bottom right now. We're crawling our way out of that that pit. I'm also optimistic in the long term. But what we see in our research is that finding digital experiences where you marry something digital with a physical object or an experience or whatever it is. Um, can you talk at all about where you see that going? Because I'm sure you've played around with it already, but but I'm sure there are other ideas that you want to test. This is definitely going to be a thing. I I really do believe it's going to be a thing because what is happening in the world today is cool. E-commerce brands are coming offline physically. They're capturing customers physically. Then they're moving those customers digitally in a new market, right? Mm. Then when they are digital again, they need to be entertained. What does that mean? That could be a then metaverse experience, for instance, something like that, which could be gamified, which could be interesting. Then from that metaverse experience, you can go back to physical, right? So there will be this thing called digital or omni-channel where brands go to a combination of offline and online. You can even see companies like, I don't know, there's a crypto company called Solana. It's one of the biggest crypto coins, right? It's basically a really innovative technology. But what do they do to capture customers? They actually made these things called Solana stores. The founder of these stores was actually the founder of a company called Beta, which is one of the most amazing consumer electronics companies, mm. which basically made physical retail spaces for all those cool consumer electronic products that you see on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. So the trend is already here. It's just going to get bigger. And then landlords, brands, retailers en masse will understand the power of this combination. And it's just trying to figure out the right formula, which I think will happen over time. I think we have plenty reason to come back to this conversation to track how the uh, these industries are developing. Uh, Jonathan Harlambakis, founder of X Nomad, uh, thank you so much for speaking to me. My pleasure, my pleasure. See you for part two. <laughs> All right, that was Jonathan Harlambakis, founder of XNomad in our HQ in Stockholm. Uh, don't forget to sign up to our newsletter. Visit scandinavianmind.com slash newsletter not to miss out on any of our upcoming content and events, including the launch of Scandinavian Mind print issue four. Till next time, goodbye.